Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to receive an introduction to wireless LANs. Specifically, we're going to do an overview of wireless LANs, talk about wireless LAN components, we'll talk about the 802.11 standard in the OSI model, how it fits in the OSI model, then max sublayer coordination, how that applies to wireless, 802.11 frame types, and finally, wireless LAN standards. So wireless LANs provide network connectivity almost anywhere. Surely you use wireless LANs. If, if you're in technology, surely you're using them, whether it's your mobile phone or your laptop, whether you're at a coffee shop or at your place of business doing BYOD. Wireless LANs typically can be implemented at much less cost than traditional wired LANs. The wired infrastructure is, of course, based on the 802.3 standards, but a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and, con and to connect devices. So as you surely know, a wireless network uses radio waves to transmit data and connect devices. Wireless LANs are defined by the 802.11 standards. Now, some additional advantages of wireless LANs over wired LANs include the following. Monetary cost, uh, flexibility, uh, that you allow users to roam in places where they normally cannot or uh, use their devices in places they always wish they could. Load distribution and finally redundancy. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but using these wireless access points, um, multiple wireless access points in one area can provide redundancy and load distribution at a much more affordable cost than wired LANs. Now, there are, there are certain components that make up wireless LANs, and let's start with the client, uh, specifically you or any of our customers. Uh, clients are basically an appliance that interfaces with the wireless medium. Now, again, that could be a mobile device. It could be a laptop. It could be a tablet. It could be a PC, but it's basically a device that operates as an end-user device. An access point functions as a bridge, basically, between the endpoints and the existing network backbone. So the access point is what the endpoints are actually communicating with. And as they roam, they may change access points throughout the building, but the access points are actually what are getting them access to the network. As you can see in this picture, access points come in many different shapes and sizes. These are just a few examples of access points. The distribution system plays a key role in communications between the customer who's trying to get on the wireless network and the major wireless LAN components that are actually switching, routing the traffic. The distribution system allows for the interconnection of the APs of multiple cells. Think of your organization. If you have one area that's considered a lab and it's a wireless lab, and that ultimately needs to communicate with marketing on the eighth floor, There's, you're going to need a distribution system to communicate between those two locations. The wireless distribution system allows you to connect multiple access points. So with wireless distribution systems, APs can communicate with one another without wires in a standardized way. Now that being said, distribution could be wired or integrated. But this capability of communications between access points is absolutely critical in providing a seamless experience for roaming clients and for managing multiple wireless networks. It can also simplify the network infrastructure by reducing the amount of cabling required. Another concept you need to understand is the basic service set. The wireless architecture divides the system into cells, referred to as basic service set and it's controlled by a base station or more commonly an access point. Now an extended service set is a set of connected BSSs. And then there's the independent basic service set, which is a wireless network consisting of at least two endpoints and no distribution system. So let's draw this out so we can get a better understanding of what we learned thus far. So in any wireless implementation, you're going to have endpoints that need to connect. So for example, here's a laptop that is connecting to the wireless network. It connects to the wireless network 
through an access point. The access point is sending out the radio waves which are being received by the laptop. The laptop endpoint then connects onto the wireless network, assuming it has the proper security configurations, and it can then reach the network. Now access points can communicate not only with laptops, but again, mobile phones. And you can think of this as a basic service set. Now, let's say in a different area, we have another access point, which is also serving customers or users. And this again could be a server, it could be a workstation, could be a printer. But regardless, it's servicing endpoints. It's a different implementation, different part of the building or a different building altogether, but this is another basic service set. So how do these two basic service sets communicate? Well, they use as you, as you have already learned, they use a distribution system. These two DSs can uplink in many ways via wireless, or in this case that we're looking, here's a wired connection. This is the distribution system that is allowing these two separate wireless implementations or basic service sets to communicate. Now, if we look at the big picture, both of these basic service sets and the distribution system, the big picture, this is the extended service set. This includes all of the wireless equipment and any equipment used to connect the wireless equipment together. The IEEE 802 standards define two separate layers for the data link of the OSI model. As you know, then these two layers are the LLC and the MAC sublayers. The 802.11 standards cover the operation of the MAC sublayer and the physical layer. The 802.11 frame consists of a 32-byte MAC header, variable length, and a frame check sequence. There are two types of coordinated functions used to ensure collision-free access on a wireless network. First, distributed coordinated fun coordination function. The MAC sublayer technique employs the well-known CSMACA to avoid collisions. It's used to manage access to the radio frequency medium, and it's composed of the following two main components, interframe spaces and random backoff. And then there's point coordination function, and the PCF is used by the AP to coordinate communications with the wireless network. The 802.11 standard uses three main types of frames. Control frames to control access to the medium, management frames to enable stations to establish and maintain communications, and then data frames sent by any endpoint. And they, these contain higher layer protocol information or data. Now there are many 802.11 standards, but you should definitely know of these and you probably already do know many of them. These standards have been rolled out over the years, and you've been on many of these networks, um, whether it's in your home or at your local coffee shop or at work. The initial 802.11 standard was serviced up to 2 megabits per second. At this point, we're at the 802.11 N standard, which theoretically can provide up to 600 megabits per second of bandwidth. So here's what you've learned. You, we've, we've done a wireless LAN overview. We've talked about wireless LAN components and how the 802.11 standard works with the OSI model. We've talked about max sublayer coordination and how that applies to wireless, 802.11 frame types, and fi finally, wireless LAN standards. Good luck with your studies.
Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video you're going to learn about the Cisco Unified Wireless Solution. Specifically, you're going to learn about access points, lightweight access points and lightweight access point protocol, wireless LAN controllers, discussing both the modes that it operates in and the interface types, and then mobility groups. So, plenty to cover, and let's begin. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network concept includes the following elements. Wireless clients, this includes laptops, workstations, etc. Access points, this provides access to the wireless network. Network management, this is accomplished through network wireless control system. It's a centralized management tool that allows for design and control of wireless networks. Network unification. The wireless LAN system needs to be able to support wireless applications by offering unified security policies, such as quality of service and RF management. So the, the WLCs, or wireless LAN controllers, offer this unified integration functionality. And then network services. Wireless network services are also referred to as mobility services and they include guest access or voice services, location services, and even threat detection and mitigation. Standalone access points are also known as autonomous access points. They're obviously very easy to install, but the thing is they can be difficult to manage in large deployments. They're not as desirable as the lightweight access points from Cisco because they must be managed individually. In addition, different parameters must be configured manually on each device, including SSID, VLAN, and security features. The Cisco Unified Wireless Network introduced the concept of lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers. That's LWAPs and WLCs. These two types of wireless devices divide responsibilities and functionalities that an autonomous access point would normally perform on its own. This technology adds scalability by separating the wireless LAN data plane from the control plane into a split MAC design. Lightweight access points focus only on the actual RF transmissions and the necessary real-time control operations, such as beaconing, probing, and buffering. Now, wireless LAN controllers manage all non-real-time tasks, such as SSID management, VLAN management, um, access point association management, authentication, and quality of service. When using lightweight access points, all RF traffic they receive must first go to the wireless LAN controller device that manage this, manages the specific access point. This changes the way in which traditional wireless LAN communication works, even for hosts associated to the same access point. The RF communication between lightweight access points and wireless LAN controllers is handled using the lightweight access point protocol. The lightweight access point tunnel can operate in either layer 2 or layer 3 mode. In layer 2 mode, the access point and wireless LAN controllers share the same VLAN, subnet, and functions with the lightweight access point, receiving 802.11 frames and encapsulating them inside Ethernet toward the wireless LAN controller. When the lightweight access point tunnel operates in layer 3 mode, the lightweight access point receives 802.11 frames and encapsulates them inside of UDP toward the wireless LAN controller. So this implies that the wireless LAN controller can be anywhere as long as it is reachable by the access point. The Cisco lightweight access point protocol can operate in the following six modes. Local mode, REAP or remote edge access point mode, monitor, road detector mode, sniffer mode and bridge mode. Every 180 seconds the access point spends 60 milliseconds on channels on which it does not operate. During the 60 millisecond time period the access point performs noise and interference measurements and scans for intrusion detection events. The REAP mode allows the lightweight access point to reside across a LAN link and still be able to communicate with the wireless LAN controller and provide the functionality of a regular lightweight access point. REAP mode is not supported on all lightweight access point models. Monitor mode is a special feature that allows lightweight access point enabled APs to exclude themselves from dealing with data traffic 
between clients. Instead, they act as dedicated sensors for location-based services, rogue AP detection, and for IDS. In RD mode, the lightweight access point monitors for rogue APs. The, ro the goal of this rogue detection of APs is to see all the VLANs in the network because rogue APs can be connected to any of those VLANs. Sniffer mode allows the lightweight access point to capture and forward all the packets on a particular channel to a remote machine that is running packet capturing software. And finally, bridge mode typically operates on outdoor APs that function in a mesh topology. This cost-effective high bandwidth wireless bridging connectivity mechanism includes point-to-point -point or multi-point bridging. Wireless LAN controllers have the following three components, wireless LAN, interfaces, and ports. The wireless LAN is the SSID network name. Every wireless LAN is assigned to an interface in the wireless LAN controller, and each wireless LAN is configured with policies for RF, QS, and other LAN attributes. The interfaces are logical connections that map to a VLAN on the wired network. Every interface is configured with a unique IP address, default gateway, and physical ports. Wireless LAN controllers support the following five interface types. The management interface, which is used for in-band management, or connect connectivity to a AAA server, an optional service port interface for out-of-band management that is statically configured, the access point manager interface used for layer 3 discovery and association, dynamic interfaces, these are the VLANs designated for wireless LAN client data, and virtual interfaces used for layer 3 security authentication, DHCP relay, and management of mobility features. One of the main features of a wireless LAN solution is the user's ability to access network resources from different areas. End users most likely move from one location to another, so designers should scale the wireless network carefully to allow for client roaming. Wireless roaming can be divided into the following two categories, intra-controller roaming or inter-controller roaming. Intra-controller roaming occurs when a client moves its association from one AP to another AP controlled by the same wireless LAN controller. Inter-controller roaming can operate in either layer two or layer three mode. In layer two, inter-control roaming moves users from AP to AP and from WLC to WLC, but they remain in the same subnet. Layer three inter-controller roaming is more difficult to implement because users can move from AP to AP and WLC to WLC from subnet to subnet as well. In this scenario, the wireless LAN controllers must be configured with mobility groups. Now, speaking of mobility groups, you may be tested on the following communication ports for mobility groups. The lightweight access point protocol control UDP 12223, lightweight access point protocol data UDP 12222, Wireless LAN controller exchange, unencrypted messages, UDP 16666, and wireless LAN controller exchange, encrypted messages, 16667. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about access points, lightweight access points, and lightweight access point protocol, wireless LAN controller modes and interface types, as well as mobility groups. This gives you a good foundation for the wireless portion, at least for unified wireless solutions and your Cisco CCDA exam. Good luck in your studies. Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we're covering wireless LAN design. We're first going to learn about redundancy and the importance of redundancy in wireless design. Then you'll learn about RF groups. And then we'll also talk about mesh design. So let's begin. Wireless LAN controllers can be configured for dynamic or deterministic redundancy. For deterministic redundancy, the AP is configured with a primary, secondary, and tertiary controller. 
This requires more upfront planning, but allows for better predictability and faster failover times. Deterministic redundancy is the recommended best practice. N plus 1, N plus N, and N plus N plus 1 are examples of deterministic redundancy. With N plus 1 redundancy, a single wireless LAN controller acts as the backup of multiple wireless LAN controllers. The backup WLC is configured as the secondary WLC on each AP. One design constraint is that the backup WLC might become oversubscribed if there are too many failures of the primary controllers. The secondary WLC is the backup controller for all APs and is normally placed in the data center. With N plus N redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. For example, a pair of WLCs on one floor serves as a backup to a second pair on another floor. The top WLC is primary for AP1 and AP2, and the secondary for AP3 and AP4. The bottom WLC is the primary for AP3 and AP4, and secondary for AP1 and AP2. There should be enough capacity on each controller to manage a failover situation. With M plus M plus 1 redundancy, an equal number of controllers back each other up. Plus, a backup WLC is configured as the tertiary. M plus M plus 1 redundancy functions the same as M plus N redundancy plus a tertiary controller that backs up the secondary controllers. The tertiary WLC is placed in the data center or network operations center. Here is a summary of wireless LAN controller redundancy. It would be good to memorize this in preparation for your exam. Next, let's talk about radio management and radio groups. The limit of available channels in the ISM frequencies used by IEEE 802.11b G and N standard presents challenges to the network designer. There are three non-overlapping channels, channels 1, 6, and 11. The recommended best practice is to limit the number of data devices connected to each AP to 20, or not more than seven concurrent voice over wireless LAN calls using G711. An RF group is a cluster of WLC devices that coordinate their RRM calculations. RF groups are formed with the following process. APs send out neighbor messages over the air. The message includes an encrypted shared secret that is configured on the WLC and pushed to each AP. APs sharing the same secret are able to validate messages from each other. The members in the RF group elect an RF group leader to maintain a master power and channel scheme for the RF group. Similar to performing an assessment for a wired network design, RF surveys are done to determine design parameters for wireless LANs and customer requirements. RF site surveys help determine the coverage areas and check for RF interference. This helps determine the appropriate placement of wireless APs. The RF site survey has the following steps. Define customer requirements such as service levels and support for VoIP. Determine devices to support. Obtain a facility diagram to identify the potential RF obstacles. Visually inspect the facility to look for potential barriers to the propagation of RF signals. Identify user areas that may be intensively used, such as conference rooms, and areas that are not heavily used, such as stairwells. Determine preliminary AP locations, which need power, wired network access, cell coverage, and overlap, not to mention channel selection, mounting locations, and antennas. Let's talk about wireless mesh for outdoor wireless. Traditionally, outdoor wireless solutions have been limited to point-to-point, point-to-multipoint -point, point -point bridging between buildings. With these solutions, each AP is wired to the network. The Cisco Wireless Mesh Networking Solution eliminates the need to wire each AP and allows users to roam from one area to another without having to reconnect. The wireless mesh components are shown here. The WCS, the WLC, the RAP and the MAP. The following are Cisco recommendations for mesh design. There is under 10 millisecond latency per hop, typically two to three millisecond. For outdoor deployment, four or fewer hops are recommended for best performance. 
with a maximum of eight. For indoor deployment, one hop is supported. For best performance, 20 MAP nodes per wrap is recommended. Up to 32 maps is supported per wrap. Throughput, one hop, 14 megabits per second, two hops, seven megabits per second, three hops, three megabit, and four hops, one megabits per second. As you can see here, you have five primary design items, number of APs, placement of APs, power for APs, number of WLCs, and placement of WLCs. The following points summarize wireless LAN design. An RF site survey is used to determine a wireless network's RF characteristics and AP placement. Outdoor wireless networks are supported using outdoor APs and Cisco wireless mesh networking APs. Campus wireless network design provides RF coverage for wireless clients in the campus using LWAPs. Each AP should be limited to 20 data devices and a data wireless LAN. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about wireless redundancy, RF groups, and mesh design. All are key points on the CCDA exam that you will need to know uh, and be able to answer, not only on your exam, but of course if you support wireless in your own network. Good luck in your studies.